The task that I have for this hour is to talk about seeking first the kingdom of God in our work. There are many possible uses for our labor. Some earn money to spend. That's what it's for. They don't do anything else with the money they earn. They simply do it to spend it. Some work to keep score. I'm better than him or her because this much money is coming into my purse. Some work so that their kids can have it better than they did. Some work so that they can buy beer, let's put it plainly, so that they can buy drugs. That's what they work for. And when they can't work enough to pay for that or they, they perhaps steal or do something worse for those things. Some work so that they simply can afford to party. Some work so that they don't have to be home. Home life is bad for some people. And so they go to work as an escape. Both men and women do this. Some work for fame. Some work for wealth. Some work just, just to eat. Some because working makes them happy. I know a man who is a, a fit man of 75. He works for the University of Texas, for the police department, and he comes to work every day and seems to be happy to be there. He could have retired long ago, but he simply likes coming to work. Some work in a quiet desperation that only death will end. When we think of seeking first the kingdom, we often think that our work is at odds with the kingdom. That if we seek first the kingdom, we have to preach or be a deacon or an elder or a Bible class teacher. For many, that's true. Parable of the Talents tells us plainly that what we've been given, we must use. When we have the ability and the opportunity, we have responsibility. And so it is for many, for a few at least, that we must preach because we have those responsibilities. But it's not true for everyone. Whether you're self-employed, others... Uh, actually have the opportunity to seek uh, the kingdom in their work, whether they're self-employed in a knife-sharpening business, or working a shift at a, a factory, or in the professions of law, or medicine, or even politics. You can seek first the kingdom in all of those areas. We may seek first the kingdom in our work when we align our purposes for work with the purposes of God. And such is possible and such is taught in the Bible. What, is, what are our purposes in work if we're seeking first the kingdom? Well, working to eat is seeking first the kingdom. In uh, the, the, the church there at Thessalonica, as has been mentioned before, was a brand new congregation of the Lord's people. And notice what the Apostle Paul taught them, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 15. I believe he had to leave that particular congregation before he wanted to and had to meet other obligations. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 through 15 outlines some of the problems that were taking place in the church there. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that worketh, walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now then that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work, and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. 
Some were walking disorderly. They were not seeking first the kingdom. In verse 6, we see that definitely, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which uh, you received of us. Paul had showed them an example of work. Now, while he was there, while he was among them, he worked for his own bread, showed them that is the pattern that they, that they should follow. Paul had commanded them, commanded them that they were to work for their food in verses 10 through 12. For when we were with you, this we commanded you, that any, if any would not work, neither should he eat. The kingdom operates as designed when we, according to our ability, work for our food. You become an asset instead of a liability. You become recognized for your industry. We, in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11, the former letter that the Apostle Paul had sent them, he told them that they were to work with their hands. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 11. And that ye study to be quiet, and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. From the very beginning, as he began to teach these these people at Thessalonica, he taught them to work. Proverbs 13, verse 4, agrees with the Apostle Paul, The soul of the sluggard desireth and, has, and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. The wisdom of the ages from Solomon. Genesis 3, 19, from the very beginning this was so. It was God's design from the very beginning after the fall that man would have to work in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. You're going to have to work for your food. This is seeking first the kingdom. If you're failing, unless you have no ability to work, if you're failing to, to work for your food, you are not seeking first the kingdom. And then there is the matter of providing for your own. This is another reason to work, to go to work, to work diligently. Because there are people that are responsible, that, that you are responsible for. First Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8, if you will. First Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. But if any provide not for his own, and specially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. The question was, how were the widows to be cared for? Paul, right here, cleared up 90% of the cases. He said uh, that this is kingdom business. He cleared up 90% of the cases when he said that families are to provide for their own. That if you work, and there are people that you're responsible for, and it is in your family, that you're responsible to care for them. It's kingdom business. God cares about how the, helper, the, about how the helpless are cared for. In stating heaven's ruling on the matter, Paul gives a principle that covers widows and all other members of the family. We are to care for, provide for, those that are in our charge, the ones that cannot provide for themselves. Notice the powerful language Paul uses. Can there be any doubt as to the, as to the importance of your labor? The, the kingdom, the family, society... Uh, a nation is blessed when families provide for their own. It is seeking first the kingdom. Some may wonder if this is too elementary. There are those that might say, well, I was taught this uh, even when I wasn't a Christian, or that it's a given, that it's always been this way, or, or that uh, uh, when, I, when I was a, a child, I wasn't even a Christian, and I was taught that I, I have to work and that a man provides for his own. But it's not always been that way. The ethic of the uh, citizens in the city of Rome was that work was for slaves, and many lived on the public dole. It was a shame for a Roman citizen to work in the city of Rome, and they were shunned for doing so. A shame for them to work. Unwanted babies were left exposed at the trash dump, 
If you didn't want your child, if it had some defect, or if, if it simply was the wrong sex, you would take it out to the trash dump and, and leave it there. And then Christians who were taught the Word of God by the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, and others went and picked up those babies and cared for them because the ethic had changed. The influence of the Word of God is seen here is powerful. In India, in the not too distant past, it was common to burn living widows on the funeral pyre with their husbands. No one would have to care for them then. They simply were, were disposed of. I, in, some, in my files somewhere is uh, an old clipping. When I say old, I mean my father gave it to me. He had clipped it back in the 60s or 70s uh, of a modern-day instance of uh, burning the widow on the, on the funeral pile, pyre. So she didn't have to be cared for anymore. The matter was taken care of, but Christianity came, and this, uh, this was changed. Why is society shocked and up in arms when a baby is found in a dumpster? Why is that true? Or when a widow is, is forsaken, or when a dog is neglected? Look to the book on your laps. The influence of that book goes beyond whether someone will simply uh, obey the gospel. It goes into the very fabric of our society. When uh, it is preached, the power will be felt. In some way, the preserving power of the Word of God is seen in the ethical choices that we were raised with. Giving is seeking first the kingdom. First, we have working to eat, providing for your own food. And then we have providing for your family. That is, seeking first the kingdom in both of those cases. But then the Bible tells us that we are to work to give. Giving is seeking first the kingdom. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 28. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 28. This is another one of my favorite passages to show the power of God in the hearts of men. Notice the transforming power of the gospel here. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing that is good, and that he may have to give to him that needeth. You go from one hand to someone who was a thief. Then the power of God comes into play, transforming that one into someone who gives from a taker to a giver. From leech to industrious, from neglector to provider, from taker to giver, such is the power of the gospel. Seeking first the kingdom in our work has to do with these basic things. Why should we work? Ourselves, our own, others. What could be more Christian? This is seeking first the kingdom. Why are we to give? Why not store up for myself and, and my family? It might be us that might be hungry someday, we might say. All things shall be added. You know, we've quoted Matthew 6.33 uh, many times during these, uh, these days of the lectureship, but we haven't quoted it all much. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. What things? The things which the Gentiles seek, a place, uh, uh, something to eat, something to wear, all these things the Gentiles seek, but the Father that knows that you have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Why shouldn't we just store it up? Because we're on the king's business. We are on the king's business and... We have to give. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Why don't we just store it up? Our Savior says, Give, and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Give, and it shall be given to you. That, uh, that word at the end of the verse, it, it, it's going to be put in, in your bosom. Well, in the ancient times, the, the kind of clothes that you wear there was an inner garment and an outer garment. And in that outer garment, 
it was open at the sides and there was a belt that went around. And you have the picture here of someone who gives coming back to his house with, with more stuck in the inside of his clothes and being carried there than he took, took out uh, away from his house. Give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Psalm 37, verse 25, a wondrous passage written by David. And if you think about some of the things that David went through, some of the hardships, the, the, the poverty out in the wilderness when he was running from Saul, you think about his humble beginnings out in the wilderness with, uh, with the sheep and being attacked by uh, uh, bears and, and lions and things of this nature. You think about what he went through, but what did he say? I have been young and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Why not just store it up? Because we trust in God and we are on the king's business. Mark chapter 10, verse 21. Thou shalt have treasure in heaven. This was told to a young man who was rich. He came to the Lord wanting to know what he needed to do. And the Lord told him to sell everything that he had and give to the poor and come and follow me and you'll have treasure in heaven. Why don't we just store it up for ourselves and our family and not, just not bother giving? Because we want treasure in heaven. Can you imagine getting to the judgment without treasure in heaven? Without that waiting for you? Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21. And I'd like to turn there and, and read that for you. Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21. This passage tells us about a man that the Bible calls a fool. He had this very idea that we're talking about, that I've worked so hard, I've stored up so many things, I have all this, why not just build bigger barns and just keep it? Keep it for myself, perhaps my family, and... Just let everyone else fend for themselves. Luke 12, verses 16 through 21, And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods built up, laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Why not just store it up for yourself and for your family? Because we don't want to be a fool. A fool standing before the judgment asking us why. You're on your job. You're there for a purpose. You're there to feed yourself. You're there to feed your family. You're there so that you can give. What else is there? We seek first the kingdom when we are on our jobs when we let our light shine. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. And the Lord's Sermon on the Mount. Our Lord says this, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. What better opportunity when you work with others to let your light shine? You know, I have been working since I was 17 years old. I have been working full time for 30 years now. And I cannot remember in that 30 years ever working with a New Testament Christian. I've been a Christian that whole time, but I can never remember having worked with a New Testament Christian. If it's true that there were, they never said anything. I didn't know it, 
or their behavior was such that they were ashamed of it. I, I, I just never have worked with one. But I know that when I come into situations, and, and uh, you can tell when behavior changes when you come near, and when you come near and uh, the coarse jesting becomes uh, proper speech, you can tell when uh, the language is cleaned up, when jer- dirty jokes are not told anymore. You know how people talk uh, 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 when you're not there. These things I have witnessed being uh, on the job for, for so long. Even when language and behavior gets worse, it's testimony to the power of the gospel. Sometimes people know you're Christians or you are a Christian and uh, they become worse at what they do and, and jeer you for it. Well, even that's a testimony to the power of the gospel. The gospel always does something. It always makes a change. Your influence always does something. It always makes a change. It either softens the heart or hardens it. It never stays the same. Never. Jesus says that they may see your good works. Honesty and respectfulness to those that are in authority is something that you must do on the job if you're going to seek first the kingdom of God. Some are, go- uh, some are going to call you a sellout. And some are going to uh, despise you because if you are the way you are, they can't get away with what they used to get away with. Others are going to be thankful, though, that they can work in an honest shop now. They sleep better because honesty rules the day and because there's someone there that... that uh, understands what integrity means. If you're in such a place, if you're working, and you have the opportunity, you can be a friend to those in need. You can tell them how you saved money on something. You can uh, share your lunch, your Tylenol sometimes. Uh, You can share your change, uh, your munchie stash. These are all things that you can do to let your light shine before men. Sharing is Christian. It's an example. You can assist a struggling young mother. You can help those that are laid off. Maybe they need a bag of groceries. Maybe they need a shoulder to cry on. Maybe they have many needs, that, that, and you can assist as you're able. Then you can tell them the truth about their soul. You know, many times uh, people have made the mistake of going into a place where they're not known and, and simply uh, getting into... Uh, a hornet's nest and and causing bad feelings, but a friend, a friend can tell someone about their soul. You show them material that helped you. And I see in the back of the auditorium, in in the foyer there, many things that you could show your friends. Things that have helped you in the past, perhaps. Things that you know will help them. Show them scriptures that helped you make a decision. Be generous with your life. Be a friend away from work. A friend in your home. Be a friend in the church. It would be much easier to invite someone to worship if they already knew several of the members here. It would be much easier. We have a grand choice before us. A grand choice. We can follow the world or we can seek first the kingdom of God. And this lectureship... We've seen that we can wallow in sin or we can fall when we fall or we can repent and confess. We can cave to the world in times of crisis or we can bear up and seek first the kingdom of God. We can meekly accept the pontifications of the PC police or we can believe, obey, and preach the word. We can follow our own will with regard to worship and worship corruptly, or we can bow to King Jesus and follow His will and seek first the kingdom of God. We can rear our children how, uh, how the liberal radicals in our society demand, or we can rear them in the fear of the Lord. We can say that mission work is too expensive and that missionaries are on glorified holidays, or we can send or go. We can waste our lives doing nothing of importance, 
or we can order our lives doing those things that have eternal value first. We can be wasteful in our spending and pay the consequences or be disciplined and reap the rewards. We can pattern our marriages after, after the world around us. God forbid. Or we can be faithful to one spouse. We can use our time as a, a single, as a time of, of uh, riotous living. Or we can remember our Creator in the days of our youth. In wicked times, we can choose to offer a pinch of incense to the emperor, or we can be faithful unto death. We can let our Bibles gather dust unread, or we can obey and love it. We can be seduced by the things of this world, or we can put God first. The message is this. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. I know the effect of the gospel. Those that, that of you that have heard these lessons, you've been changed in some way. You have been helped, or your heart has been hardened. There's no way around it. Such is the effect of the gospel. It always has an effect. For some of you, your priorities have been reordered, and you have already responded to the gospel invitation in your hearts. But there may be others that may need to that may need to make a, a public invitation, answer a public invitation. And as we have not planned one at this time, when one is uh, available, that's the time when you need to make it, make it so. Yes. 596. And we will have an invitation at, at this time. 596 if... 586 is the invitation song. For one or more, your response may require you to make public your repentance because you have not sought first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. If your sin is a public one, we give you the opportunity at this time to make it known publicly that, that you've repented. You'll be prayed for. You'll be accepted back and uh, joyfully so. If you've never been baptized for the remission of your sins, if you're, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a member of the family of God, if you're not a member of the church that Jesus built, the Church of Christ, today we implore you, seek first the kingdom of God. That's the only place where you're promised the blessings of heaven. That's the only place where spiritual blessings are, are offered. That's the only place where you can find them. I assure you they're not in the world. I assure you they're not in your apathy. I assure you, if you leave this place without ha having obeyed the gospel, I don't, I, I don't know when your next opportunity will be to obey the gospel. Well, we can assist you right now if you have not obeyed the gospel. And we can baptize you for the remission, the removal, the forgiveness of your sins. And you can leave this place clean, just as the day you were born. You can leave it on a new path, and you can leave it seeking First, the kingdom of God. If we can assist you in your obedience, won't you come and sit on one of these front pews as we stand and sing? Nailed to the cross is the heart right with God.